Thank you all very much. I am absolutely honored to sit here with a panel of my esteemed colleagues here. And one of the things that I want to say is, is A, to thank everybody up front. Because when you're in charge of running the businesses that we have to run, and you're given the awesome responsibility to also deliver transformation that can be highly taxing on your time. So the time and effort is not wasted on everybody attending here. So I want to thank everybody for being committed to be a thought leader in this space and for joining us on this panel. So with that, I will allow my team of esteemed colleagues to introduce themselves. Alec, or Marcos. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Marcos Acosta. I'm the GM uh, General Manager for Digital Transformation at um, Yamaha Motors. Um, it's an honor to be here, to be frank, so thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I've been going through this transformation since uh, we were taking retailers online, and we call it e-commerce, uh, with companies such as, you know, Carter's. Uh, then we moved to cloud computing and marketing technology with, um, with um, CNN, for example, taking the, the TV legacy uh, brand um, to the digital space, and recently with um, Yamaha Motors and, um, and the automotive industry now embracing this AI transformation. Hello, my name is Chris Jacobs. Uh, it is an honor to be here. Um, so I'm, I'm director of concept design at Rivian. Uh, so concept design is inside of the user experience group, which sits inside of Studio. At Rivian, we work in a really cool way because uh, UX is in studio, so studio and UX, we work with each other. Uh, there's nothing like you know thrown over the, the fence at us. Uh, so it's a very streamlined approach and everybody works with each other. Um, so at Rivian, I just helped to, to develop uh, new products for the vehicle, whether they be in the HMI, or whether it be a control or the steering wheel, how the steering wheel works, um, how it interacts with the UI and things like that. So yeah, thank you. Awesome. Hi, everybody. I'm Jake Schneider. I'm the VP of Marketing and Innovation for Gold's Gym, one of the most recognizable fitness brands in the world. Um, also one of the oldest fitness brands in the world. I feel like I've found my people here. We've seen avatars. We've heard Taylor Swift. We've talked about, you know, all the, all the challenges that we have in getting AI instituted. Uh, prior to joining Gold's Gym, which I'm relatively recent, I led digital strategy and innovation for an Omnicom agency based out of Dallas. Yes, hi. Uh, Alex Pham, Chief Architect at the R&D uh, Infotech Lab within Toyota. One of my responsibilities is to take a emerging technologies, and of course AI is definitely one of them. How to integrate all of that into the Toyota ecosystem uh, for our mobility initiative. Um, yeah, that's it. Excellent. So now that we have a chance to meet the panel, I'd like to pose a question to each member of the panel, and I'll give you an opportunity each to respond. So the question that I have is, as fast as technology is advancing today, it's never moved this fast, and it's never going to move this slow again. So if you could share with us what it is that you're doing to keep pace and to leverage the technology at the speed of advancement. Marcos? Yeah, I think uh, there are a few slides um, on this, so I'll, I'll wait for that. But um, I'll, I'll share with you guys uh, what we're doing, and then I'll, I'll talk about um, you know, how we're thinking about uh, the future. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? That's me. <laughs> That's Chris. <laughs> So uh, while well, they pulled uh, the this, slide, this so Yamaha Motor, um, global company, uh, we have a, a, a wide range of you know, products uh, from motorcycles uh, to boats to e-bikes to uh, golf carts, uh, believe it or not. And um, there you are. And um, the, 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 main, the main mission of the company uh, is to create memorable experiences with our consumers using our products. Uh, so selling the product is, is not enough for us. We really need to connect emotionally with these consumers and make sure that we move their hearts right, on, on a deeper level. So with that, we are, we're using 
we're leveraging uh, the digital transformation and artificial intelligence to accomplish that, um, that goal. And I'll talk about how we're approaching this. Can you go to the next slide, please? So, um, so right now, uh, we are um, taking data and AI uh, very seriously and placing that at the center of uh, the digital transformation and the AI transformation. We're using and leveraging AI and, and data across the whole uh, value chain, from planning products, developing the products, uh, doing the production of the products, the sales, the customer service in that uh, particular channel, and ultimately marketing and um, also the representation of that across our digital channels, online and offline. So what we've done is we, we're gathering data across three different entities. Uh, the first one is uh, our IoT data. So motorcycles, boats, they send data to uh, Yamaha US, and we understand uh, key data points there, speed, distance, um, range, um, location of this, and, and we, we truly get how these products are being used, right, on a daily basis. The second one is customer data. Uh, every touch point across um, where that they're online or offline, our channels, we get some information from, from the consumers and we learn from them. Remember, going back to our vision, we want to connect with them. It's not just giving them the product, right, and then try to get the next sale. And um, the last part is we, we get thousands of data points from our uh, factories, uh, manufacturing plants, that we also use. So we aggregate this data, clean this data, and leverage this data to do everything that we do across the company. And we're putting uh, AI on top of that. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Let's say that we wanted uh, to create a new uh, motorcycle, um, electric motorcycle. So the information about what's the average of the commute right, for our consumers uh, from Monday to Friday, what's the speed that they're driving um, at, how they're using the products during the weekends, plus all those interactions that we have online. We get all that information plus marketing and price, um, and we design the specs for the best product that is going to bring, uh, obviously, uh, uh, the, the best, the best uh, uh, value for the consumers and, and the best value for our company, right? So, uh, and, and that's how we're using um, AI and data across all the value chains. We're unlocking as we go, uh, more and more use cases, and we're implementing those use cases. Um, the second part, uh, can we go to the next? I'll, I'll talk about things that we are considering in the future. Um, so the first one is democratization of AI. It was mentioned in some of the panels before that everybody's going to be impacted by this, every single employee across the company, so we're taking very seriously not only releasing new applications and new products, but how do we get, how we get our employees ready for this revolution, right? So we are training our employees in different levels from understanding Python and how to code Python to leveraging some tools uh, to interact with AI to then move into real use cases, what they're facing on a daily, daily basis that they're resolving manually today and how they can use AI to accomplish that. So that's one big part of what we're doing, and we have trained um, the last year 1,500 people. Uh, on the other side, we're thinking about how the business is going to be disrupted, right? And there are two things that I want to mention there. One, and it was mentioned before uh, today, I, I don't believe that this time is different. Uh, I believe that, you know, jobs are not going to go away. Uh, but on the other hand, you humans are going to gain amazing leverage with the use of AI. So I start thinking about what those, are, what those use cases are. And the last point that I have there is we are thinking, I'm thinking very deeply about how the Internet business is going to be disrupted by this. If we think about the Internet today, just to keep it simple, 80% of the revenue comes from two areas clicks 
and e-commerce. Either you're clicking on a video, article, advertisement, or you're adding products to the, your shopping cart. Both of those scenarios require the interaction of humans with screens. Okay, fast forward a few years, and all of a sudden we have agents where I can go there and say, hey, I want to go to Venice for two weeks. This is the budget that I have. This is the time that I have. Just buy the ticket for me. There's no screen interaction there. All right. So I'm, I'm thinking all the time, well, in that, if we get to that point, what is the business model for the internet? Where are the revenues coming from? How we need to adapt as a company to embrace that and prepare for that? Excellent. Thank you very much. Chris? Yeah. Thank you. Well, so I'm not going to have slides like that. Um, I, I can't talk about what Rivian is doing, although we are doing AI. And uh, I am uh, leading the UX uh, for an in-vehicle AI experiment. Um, so I wanted to, is this up here? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is really more about my own journey, about how I keep up. This is me when I was about 12 years old. Um, I actually did a summer job at a computer store and I got paid in hardware which was wonderful. Um, but uh, yeah, for, for also me, heavy against child labor laws now, but yeah, yeah. I know exactly. Yeah, it's actually owned by the mob, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so I, I uh, was always in my, when I was like eight years old, I walked, I was ice skating with my mom and uh, we went outside in this mall in LA and this guy said, hey kid, you know, what's your name? And I said, it's Chris. He goes, here, come here for a second. And we walked over to a TRS-80 and he typed in my name on, the, on the, the keyboard, and up on the screen came my name in big letters. And I looked at it and went, my God, the future. So I knew right then that that was what I wanted to, to do. So I begged my mother to get that computer for me, and she's like, uh, no, because it was $500 back then. But she did put it on layaway, and after many, many months, I did get it, and I programmed the heck out of that thing. Uh, and uh, so, for me, just, just keeping up with, 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 with uh, what's going on in, in technology. So here's a picture of all the, the computers that I actually got to use over my lifetime. Uh, interestingly, at the bottom one, that laptop is more powerful than all of the ones on top of it, uh, if you put them all in one. Um, but this one, this is a great slide. This, uh, this is what, when I was a kid, I looked at at Popular Science, and I loved going through the back pages and seeing all the new tech that was, you know, was going on and all that. And that's what I'm doing now. I'm doing that with what's going on in AI, what's going on with uh, machine learning, uh, and, and you know, just looking at all of the apps out there. All, you know, I have a subscription to probably like, like 15 apps, whether it be music, music generation or voiceover generation or ChatGPT or... You know, I have uh, uh, LM Studio on my, my, my very fast p PC at work. Uh, I work with Studio. They're using Comfy UI to develop, you know, you know, 3D models. And the amount of things that I need to put into my mind every single day is overwhelming. Um, but it's, it's amazing. And I, I, it's great that I have the opportunity to be able to learn and look and push and experiment and uh, so the, my story isn't necessarily about what, what Rivian is doing, but it's just about how do you keep up? Because it's so fast. You know, we made a joke, uh, that this, was, this was last night, about a, a technology. And I said, it'll be done. In, it, I said, it'll, it'll be about an hour until that happens, you know, because it really is going that fast. I mean, AI, it's ridiculous. You look, you know, s six, six months ago, it's nothing like it is now. Um, so uh, here it says here, um, this is kind of a, a summary, but you know, I grew up reading popular science. Uh, I spent a large percentage of my life keeping fit about what's new. Uh, and then having been steeped in technology since I was eight years old, um, you know, is, is, uh, is something that I just I keep with me. And I appreciate where we are now because of where we were. I look at technology of where we were. I look at computers of where we were. I worked on a computer in, in school learning how to do CAD, and there was a 20 megabyte, uh, no, five, five megabyte drum that cost $20,000, five megs. Um, and also, I want to say that I appreciate attempts like the Humane AI panel. Have you all heard about that? 
the, there's all these blogs about how horrible it is and how what a terrible product it is. I don't think it's a terrible product. I think it's fantastic that they did that product. I think it's wonderful that they, they invented it and they, they got it on the market and people are using it. And even if they hate it, that's good, right? You know what people want, what they don't want, but at least they did it. And so I see AI as a tool for unprecedented, uh, unprecedented creativity, not world-ending chaos like a lot of... You know, when, you, when I talk to my, some people who are outside of the, the, the business I'm in, they're like, oh, AI is going to destroy everything. I'm like, no, it's actually going to increase our creativity. You know, our, the kids that are using it now who are, growing, who are going to be growing up with it and the leaps and bounds that it's going to be, you know, m moving, they're going to grow up with it and they're going to find out ways to use it that we never even considered. We never, would, we can't. We have no idea what they're going to do with it. And um, I can't wait to see what's going to happen in that respect. Uh, yeah, so I envision my children using it in ways we never thought imaginable. So uh, just, just keeping up is exciting. It's fun. It's interesting. Um, it's stressful. Uh, and for a company that you work for that is wanting to do it, but they're afraid, you know, I was a CES and I saw what Mercedes did. We, there was a whole, like, big presentation with a you know, a, a, a video and all this stuff, and they basically put ChatGPT in the car. It wasn't interesting. The way they marketed it was interesting, but how, you know, how, how we're gonna put AI in the car is going to do, it's not gonna be ChatGPT. It's gonna be something that's useful, something that is not what you might think it would be. So, um, stay tuned. Oh, I think that's it. Thank, thank you very much. Chris? I'll now juggle oh. all three of them. <laughs> Double fisted. <laughs> the clicker. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's okay. It's all, it's all UX. <laughs> <laughs> Again, that's how I know you all are my people. I, I think the other thing, when I, when I listened to the, the previous two panels, uh, one of the things that I heard definitely was if we rewound everything four years, most of us are sitting trying to explain the value of AI to somebody uh, on, a, on a board, basically, or a client, um, and they're looking at you at blank stares saying, I, I, I don't get it, right? And if you fast forward two years from that, they're probably saying, what are we doing about AI right now, right? And uh, that is actually a position that I found myself in at the exact same time points. It's just kind of like, what, is, what does this mean? I don't get it. This is smoke and mirrors. Um, and the, the other piece of that is, and I think it was on Juliana's uh, panel, is the idea of putting that $10 million to an educational course for people so they can better understand the value of AI, especially at a C-suite level, uh, so that you're not spending so much time trying to validate or get into proofs of concept that may not go anywhere because they're similar projects. On a personal note, like I relate AI back to 20, uh, the end of 2020 when my wife and I decided to do a small renovation project that turned into us renovating 80% of our house. And what we quickly discovered, and it was all on the unsexy stuff, it was all on foundational pieces, plumbing, uh, electrical, foundation. And when you do something like that and you spend that large amount of money, you're not bringing people over to say, hey, do you want to come underneath the house and look at my foundation? Or look at this amazing electrical work that we do, right? And it's the same thing. It's like, look at this vertically integrated stack of data that's flowing and how clean it is. And people just look at it and say, what's the creative output of that? But it's something that we have to consider when we're looking at AI is the, the foundational pieces uh, are going to be expensive-ish the longer we wait to put them in place. And for golds, and coming on golds in November, uh, and kind of taking the view of, we are a legacy gym. Again, one of the most recognizable gyms uh, or fitness companies in the world. Everybody knows Arnold, uh, and relating all the way back to that. But we have to think like a data and media company that does gyms, that has gyms, and focus on that experience. We have to look at everything from a technology stack on a two, five, and 10, because things change so rapidly in what we're doing, but we need to be prepared for that. And then we need to get his feedback as, as quickly as often, not from internal and not from partners, but how this is relaying to, uh, to our customers and our members and people on the ground and how they're experiencing it. Uh, Perry made a really great point on, no one cares about, like, again, this extensive UI infrastructure, it's more they just want to get from point A to point B to point C as quickly as possible, and any kind of interference with that kind of creates an ick for them. 
that we're trying to remove. Which leads to kind of my second point in this. Experience matters more than ever, especially if we're playing into younger audiences. AI, from a creativity end, is probably the most divisive topic when you're talking creative in the past 20 years. There are sides that are like, this is great, we're accelerating through, look at all of this stuff that I'm doing in mid-journey to this is an abomination on creativity, and <laughs> I am an artist, and everything is personal, and there's some places in the middle on how we can get faster and more, more proper. One of the, the uh, one of the best books I've read in the past year is Unreasonable Hospitality, and all, all the way talks about the context of the customer and placing the customer at the center, um, but really placing those surprise and delight moments with them. Um, and that context is key. People want to feel seen when they interact with your businesses, when they walk into your brick and mortar locations all across the board. So context and knowing them, that allows you to focus on the emotional value of what you do, not just a transactional endpoint, which is what we're, we're uh, delivering. And then most importantly, be interesting. It allows you to be interesting. Um, and allows you to play in some of these super cool dynamics that a gym normally wouldn't uh, via the context of this is innovative, right? So there's my proof of concept in doing something fun. So when we're talking about, listen, up until this point, it's never been uh, faster, but we will no never be as slow. It's all about preparation for us and how we get there. Excellent, Chris, thank you. Alex? Can you hear me? Yep. Good. All right, let's start your sum. Okay, got it. So how many of you have FOMO? Quite a bit, right? Imagine on the other hand, what if you have stampede? We are stamping on each other, try to do things so fast. So I would recommend to you is take a deep breath and relax a little bit. AI is going to be here, and we're not going to mess it out. It's not at all. But I would say first, in your cooperation, in your thinking, start out with what is your vision. What do you want to do? Uh, for example, let me give you an example. Um, what is your employee interaction that you think five, 10 years from now, what would that be? Are they going to the internet and search, you know, where my 401k? Are they going to say, what is my benefit? Um, how do you retain the employee? How do you make sure that they satisfy? All this thing, think of the vision of where you're going to be, how the interaction of that employee experience is going to go. And that's where you start your AI strategy. Um, how many of you have in car and say, you know, you go to service and you hated it, right? How long did it take, right? So it's not the thing that we are actually looking at at the vision level, okay? What if I could change that service experience you have instead of having to go to the dealer and have to wait for two hours, the car brings it to the cell. The car reminds you exactly when you need to go. So some of this is the vision thing that you have to think about. That's where you start. Now, if you look from that perspective and say, okay, this is where my AI strategy, how is this AI strategy going to fit? How, so first define the what, and then define the how. Now you say start building this, but you are not by yourself. You know, you have the whole business, IT, technology together. So capture innovative use cases associated with that. And how do you move at this fast pace? Especially many of you just recognize and say, my business do not know. How do I educate them? Bring it one thing at a time. Show like this where we are here. Go see and learn. One of the things that I practice and say, I go and I hear, I listen, I come back, I send a note to my you know, business partner or anybody else, learn. We do an expo, for example. We drag in the, the business, come in to see some of the stuff that we do. And we generate idea from that perspective and let the business understand what business, that, what that concept would look like when you have generative AI. Give them a imagination, give them the thinking, give them an idea of what they need to do in their own business. Whether in marketing, it was legal in contract. For example, how do you do contract search today? What if I can automate that contract and says right now you have to search for every single class or do an IP, uh, um, uh, do an IP uh, 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 search? It's all text time. But if you find a way to automate it, define the what and then let's the how, which is AI, and there are plenty of partners, plenty of smart people in this room that we help you to get there. 
So those are the area that I would think that we have. And then finally, they develop an innovation mindset as don't think just today, don't think just AI operational. Relax a little bit and think about the next step. What that's go, that next step going, go, go, going to be? Then create an AI governance because basically, I tell you, business A, business B, business C, they all come up with ideas and we all have some idea that overlap each other. If we don't do it, then you have, okay, one AI going to this initiative, one AI on that initiative, and you have a mess. So you need to organize, make sure you have a governance framework in place, and that's how I would do it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. So when, when I think about technology moving as fast as it's moving, uh, I've been called on occasion, sometimes I'm partly cloudy because sometimes the future isn't always sunny, right? So if we think about the partly cloudy of innovation moving as fast as it's moving, give me your perspective on we have industries, especially in the manufacturing industry or supply chain industries, that are highly risk averse. And those of us that have been responsible for corporate strategy, digital strategy, transformation, that doesn't happen overnight. And you have industries that are so focused on small, you know, non-risky, you know, non-cost, you know, prohibitive projects that really don't move the needle. How do we move the needle when it comes to the industry and the AI revolution and adoption of that technology? Um, so, I mean, I think that, that happens with every change in the industry, right? So you start with, you know, the technology pushing the different organizations and, and, and you start creating, you know, proof of concepts and finding, you know, areas where you can add value. And, and eventually, I believe that the market is the one that pushes you and push, uh, pushes the organization to move, to move faster, right? So if I think about AI today, um, I believe that we're going to accelerate this very, very fast, very, very quickly. Until now, it's been proof of concepts, small projects, convincing the enterprise. But when I start thinking about the stack of AI, so at the bottom, I have, you know, you have the, uh, you have the chips, right? So N N NVIDIA, you know, successful case there. You move up to the stack and you start thinking about the models. And you have open source and, you know, closed source. So you have OpenAI, you have Llama, you have other key players there moving very, very quickly. Now you move to the next um, part of the stack and, and it is all the infrastructure, right? And, and, you know, we just learned that, you know, NVIDIA last quarter is like $20 billion, $18 billion from data centers. So that tells me right there that this is going to accelerate very, very quickly. It is not PLCs anymore. And the area where, I'm, where I want to invest the most is the application development stack that is going to sit on top of that data center or on top of that those models. So the other companies, at least from my opinion, they have proven that this is here to stay. The investment is there. This is evolving very, very quickly. And that investment in, in the data, data centers uh, in particular, you know, for me, is, was the key to say, oh, we're going to move very quickly on the app stack of the revolution. And that's where I'm trying to identify the best use cases for, you know, for Yamaha and, and basically focus on that. Thank you for that. I'm going to be more brief because our time is running out here. Um, so just do it, right? There's a lot of companies that wait to see what their other, other companies are doing, and they're like, well, we want to see what they're doing first. We want to see what they're doing first. We found that we just make stuff and we launch it internally. We let people play with it. We let them adopt the idea of it, and we we get them excited about it. You know, the whole, everybody who's using it could be excited about it. So it's much easier to sell it. Um, and, you know, they say that fail often and fail fast. Uh, we don't really want to fail often and fail fast, but we want to show off something that may not be great, uh, that may be a start, 
And, um, you know, we are not afraid to do that. And we're not afraid to, uh, to put out something um, that uh, the CEO, you know, hasn't seen yet. <laughs> and so he might, you know, make a discovery of it as well. Uh, but, you know, I, I worked at a company a while, I can't say who, and uh, we were doing an OTT over the top. And one day the VP slammed his fist on the desk and he's like, God damn it, you know, this other company just launched something. And I said, well, we've been sitting here just, tr you know, t talking about doing it for a year. Um, and so after that, I was like, we just have to do it, have to make it, you know. And that's just what we do. So uh, just don't be afraid. Just make something and launch it internally. If you don't want the, your customers to see it yet, just get people excited about it. Fail often enough that you create a beautiful concept that you can sell in yeah. eventually. I think the needle will be moved for you eventually, right? And it's going to reveal this kind of state <clears throat> that we've been in for the past 10 to 12 years of the marketing jargon of we're a data-driven company. It will come to pass in a put up or shut up because it'll be easily recognizable who is data-driven utilization of AI versus who has all of these disparate tools and partners that they've cobbled together in order to formulate something. And so uh, to your point, just do it, but plan with great infrastructure to be able to see ahead in that two to five to 10 year period because everything's gonna change in those periods anyways. And to your point, it keeps you from being less reactive. So this person isn't standing up saying, God damn it, why didn't we do that? It's look at where we are in a competitive space and more of a race to you know, be best in class. Um, for the risk asset organization, which Toyota definitely is one of them, so uh, my recommendation is fairly simple. Try something small, something tactical. Do a POC, build your confidence, build your success with AI. Don't have to be afraid because one of the things that most people are afraid of AI is one, it's too big, it's too complex, it's too costly, it's unexplainable, right? So now, how do you make that thing so small? By create and build something positive, incremental result, doing something well like the unit testing, and make sure that it works. And then you build your confidence in each of the use cases, and then expand from there. So I would say, risk adverse organization, have at it. Don't, as, as everybody say, don't be afraid. I say, yeah, be fearful, because you need to explain this somehow to the business, that's AI will work. So uh, have an understanding, but it takes time. Yeah, don't, 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 don't just, don't just do, don't think it's too complex. That way I say, keep it simple. And if there was, if there was one overarching challenge or one major challenge that you think that we're faced with in order to adopt the AI that we're trying to, with the revolution, what would that be? I, I think just having people get over their fear people who don't understand what AI does or understand the complexities of it, um, that you say that we're going to do something in AI. I have a great example. Um, I was at a book signing. A friend of mine wrote this book called The Sympathizer, which is an HBO show right now. And uh, we were over at Stanford. And, uh, and I, this is when ChatGPT was all the rage. And I, uh, I, I walked over to a writer who was with my, my, my friend uh, Viet, and I said, uh, are oh, you a writer? She's like, yeah, I'm a writer. I go, do you ever use ChatGPT? She went, no. You know, she was so offended. So I think that there's this, like, this notion of that it's like this bad thing. It's like this terrible shortcut. And so people need to get over themselves and say, okay, how can, you know, what's the, think a little bit more deeply, like what's the, 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 how is it, how can it help in a more complex way rather than just, you know, writing a paragraph? Yeah, I know creative directors that take a personal affront to mentioning GPTs or Midjourney or anything like that. Uh, but I do think it's fighting words. Yeah, I do think it's it's education. Um, it's it's everywhere in different forms, so it's omnipresent, right? It can be invisible that you don't notice it, or you could be changing an avatar of yourself, you know, into something else. And so it's. It, really teaching people who aren't in it on a day-to-day -day basis, because we all are, in understanding like it can be this, it can be this, it's not always out of the box, and if it is out of the box, it took forever to get here in a way that's consumable for the general public. So it's working into how it is 
I'm going to use, an, I'm a recovering agency person, so please bear with me. How, as authentic so as possible. I. Yeah. 16 yeah, it's hard. years. It's hard for me to not be like authenticity and scalability. Um, but the truth of the matter is in, in teaching that, uh, in helping them along in small doses, small wins, base hits get you high in the lineup. So just kind of pushing that forward. Um, yeah, so something that I will add, um, I agree education of, you know, and training people and helping them understand, you know, how it works is, is key. Otherwise it's gonna be extremely difficult, but I think that people are also afraid of letting go 100%, right? So I have this AI, great, who is going to monitor this thing that is going to be making decisions? I don't want to let go. Uh, that thing shouldn't be making decisions. That's my job, right? And that's, that's in their head. So I think that a, 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 a multiple step program there to introduce AI where you say, well, this is going to help you be more productive, right? It's following your strategy, which we're going to program you have still some time to monitor what this agent is doing, right, before, right, uh, something gets executed. That gives people time to, if we, if we could, build the relationship with the AI agent, right, and you start working with the agent and partnering with the agent to the point where they're going to say, no, I don't want to do that. Let's, let's, let's allow the agent to make those decisions. I have something more important to do. So taking that approach where it's a partnership, it's a relationship that you're building, uh, it's a collaboration with this agent, I think is going to help us um, make the transition faster. Excellent. Alex? Um, yeah, oh, well, a couple of things. The first thing is uh, change the mindset a little bit. I start with AI and I say that's fearful because I tell you, I could not give up. Uh, I, I could not keep up with, the, uh, with all the AI going on currently. When this go like this, you have Lama 1, 2, 3, and you have Gemini Pro, you have Gemini 1, 4, 5. Well, I tell you, many of them I haven't tried. Uh, but the key thing is change the mindset. AI is fun. AI is innovative and it's here. So learn one thing at a time and then just, if you're able to do that, not only with yourself, but within some other few folks, and that will probably start the people to excited about AI within the company. Uh, if we want to do it one big one, I don't know how successful it is. So we do an expo and we explain to the business some of the stuff we do. But I tell you, every single day I read out there is a news there, there is AI. And that's just where our fear of not only missing out, but fear of not keeping up. Uh, that's a sort of part of it. So I'm good thinking I probably will never be able to keep up. Just keep myself relaxed and go in one pace at a time and learn as I go. So, so I think what I heard is technology is moving at a very rapid pace. Industry historically has not moved at the pace of innovation. And I think all of us here are challenged with navigating and operating in that space. And how we collectively come together and provide that thought leadership to come up with those solutions to make the industry adoption more palatable, I think is going to reap the benefits for all of us to see in order for us to continue to be able to keep pace. So as Chris would say, everybody, I think we're all charged to just do it. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>